Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Gabby Morgan. I'm the grad assistant um, in the Career for Professional Development, um, and this is the Diversity and Inclusion Series on Women in the Workplace. Um, super excited to have a conversation and just a discussion on important issues that women face. Um, I want to just start with kind of the goal of the series in general. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, the other GAs have also done different um, groups, different workshops. So our main goal is to, to provide career development dialogue and resources for underrepresented student identity groups as they transition to the workforce. So we've done Black Indigenous people of color, um, students with disabilities, we've done veterans, now we're doing women, and then later we'll have an LGBTQ um, workshop as well. So we're just doing this to kind of cover our basis and to be informed and to educate other people. So, and then the purpose of our time tonight together is to focus on women essentially and just facilitate conversation on career decision-making, issues on negotiation, um, issues with fairness and promotion, and women's empowerment in the workplace, how we can improve on that. Um, and then in the chat, I'm gonna drop in um, a resource for you guys if you wanna take notes. Um, also, there are, um, let me make sure it's the right one. Also, um, our contact information is on there. We'll have time for a Q&A at the end, um, you know, time for networking if that's what you wanna do. Um, but you can open that if you want to just take notes on the topics we talk about. It'll just be kind of a Q&A discussion, if that makes sense. So we'll have questions prepared for the panelists and then move into a time of audience Q&A. Um, but feel free to keep notes, feel free to contact us, stay after, whatever you need to do. If you, we need to ask a question, you can unmute. Um, chat or private chat if you feel more comfortable doing that. Um, so first I want to introduce our lovely panelist. Um, so first I'll introduce Lori and I'm going to read her bio for her. Um, so Dr. Lori N. Pindar, she currently serves as the Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Department of Communication at Clemson and she is the Assistant Director of the Irwin Center for Brand Communications. As an advisor, instructor, and mentor, she combines her professional and personal interests and in her research related to branding, tokenism, tempered radicals, and gifted students in higher education. Beyond university life, she has her own communication consulting business and travels extensively in her free time and works to champion study abroad opportunities for students in leading trips, most recently to Cyprus, and an upcoming trip to Belgium. She earned her BA in 2009 from Clemson and her master's in journalism from the University of Georgia in 2011. Also snap to that. After a career in journalism, she returned to the academy and completed her doctorate in educational leadership in 2014 from Clemson. When not at work, you can find her volunteering with her sorority, Delta Sigma Theta, or on campus at Norris Hall as she is currently the faculty in residence for the fraternity and sorority of community. Lori, thank you so much for being with us. We're so excited to have your perspective on these issues. Um, you know, just hearing your bio, literally amazing. Um, so next, this is in no particular order, by the way. <laughs> um, next, we have Sable Lee. Sable joined the Clemson Student Athletic Development Team in January 2020. At Clemson, she serves in the role of Assistant Director of Student Athlete Development. In this role, she oversees career and, career and personal development, Tigers Unite, and employer relations for Clemson Student Athlete Development Department. Prior to Clemson, she served as the coordinator of student athlete and staff development at Texas Tech University. She also serves as a consultant for leadership development and issues surrounding gender violence to student athletes, coaches, and athletic department staff members. Lee, which is a native of, how do you say that, Sable? Oh, is it Oviedo? You got it, Oviedo. Whoop, whoop. Okay. Oviedo, Florida. Um, she earned her Bachelor's of Science in Sport Management from Jacksonville University in 2016, where she was a four-year member on the softball team. She also earned her Bachelor's of Business Administration and Master's in Sport Business Management from the Devo Sport Business Management Program at the University of Central Florida in December 2017. Yes, Sable, killing it. <laughs> so next we have Caitlin Baker. She is entering her ninth year at Clemson University and is a senior lecturer in the Department of Communication. During her tenure, she has primarily taught public speaking, foundational courses in the department, and introduction to cross-cultural communication. She also leads a study abroad program to Dublin every summer, 
Currently, she's leading a team of faculty in the department to clarify the goals and restructure core theory and method courses in the major. Incredible. Um, as a recent graduate of the Trailblazer, Trailblazers program, she works within and beyond the department to create positive change that enhances student learning, engage teaching, and evaluation at the university. She loves working with students to achieve their goals in both the classroom and after graduation. In her free time, she enjoys home projects, learning new recipes, and anything on the ID channel. Thank you so much for being here, Caitlin. You're amazing. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have Paris Celeste. Um, she's a software product owner in digital banking for NCR Corporation, a Fortune 500 company headquartered in Atlanta. Yes. And a global leader in payment technologies. She has worked in software product management for almost a decade. She earned her BA in English from the University of West Georgia and her master's in journalism and mass communication from the University of Georgia. In 2012, Paris, <laughs> Paris moved back to her home state of New York where she worked at Columbia University in the Sponsored Projects Administration, which handles over a billion dollars in research grants per year. Wow, amazing. After several years in New York City, she returned to Atlanta where she managed several software applications and in industries, including education, healthcare, transportation, and financial technology. She loves traveling with her husband in her spare time and creating inspiring travel stories, which are posted on Instagram at, at passport.paris and www.passportparis.com and cuddling with her 12-year-old dog, Maximus. Paris, thank you so much for being here, and thank you to um, each and every single one of you for being here. Um, each of you brings such a unique perspective to the issues we're going to talk about, and I'm just so thankful you all are here um, tonight. So, wow, let's just get started. Um, <laughs> um, so, for our questions, like I said at the beginning, we have questions prepared, but we'll also open kind of it, we'll open it up to the audience at the end. Feel free, like I said, chat, you know, unmute, do whatever you need to do. I want this to be a discussion, a dialogue. Um, so yeah, we'll start with just a general question and anybody can answer it. This is not too directed to any of you. Um, but can any of you recall a time in your professional life where something pertaining to work was like more difficult or harder because you identify as a woman? Well, I'll, uh, I'll start. And I think it's one of those complicated being a woman in the workplace situations where, um, and Kaylin, you might be able to speak to this too, but we had, a, I feel like um, I enjoy people creating life. Women are amazing in their ability to do that. Um, and in higher ed, whenever you do have someone who is expecting, uh, you can, you know, FMLA exists. And so making adjustments, and I think our department has been great and the institution has been really amenable to understanding new policies and procedures around that. However, um, I was in a position prior to this institute, coming to this institution where um, there were a lot of people expecting and the workload got shifted and it got shifted to others that were not um, either in relationships or were perceived to be single or otherwise their workload without having a child uh, was assumed to be less than. And so it was very difficult because we're all women, but because I was lacking the spouse or the child, uh, that burden of womanhood became even more taxing because how do you combat that? You don't want your sister here to be um, overburdened because you know they're literally creating life, right? But at the same time, you also are living your own life with your own series and series of battles and things that you have going on. So articulating that, especially as a graduate student was especially difficult. Um, and there are many ways, especially with the layer of graduate assistant that I could not because I didn't want to uh, buck the system, if you will, because I thought it was my responsibility. And then there's all sorts of other things about my value and not wanting to be perceived as not wanting to do something. So it was a position, and again, not in my current department, but in an assistantship that I had that was very difficult for me to navigate for 16 weeks when I was tasked with doing three different jobs that were not my own. So that was something that I think proved really challenging and that I still sit with because as it happens now, you don't want to be that person that says, well, why? Uh, you want to be helpful, but then where's that limit where you have to advocate for yourself? And that's still something that I think is a challenge today. 
and that we could do a better job as an institution, as institutions in understanding family issues, women's issues, and the inequities therein that almost are prescribed difficulties that we're left to figure out without help. I can add one or add more off of Lori's. Can y'all hear me okay? Um, this is completely changing the subject, but Lori and I work in the same department now. And so I know that she's heard me talk about this before. But as a female instructor, I know that one thing that we experience that I don't assume men do, sorry. Um, there is an evaluation at the end of the year, the student evals. I will have at least one comment a year that is something about my appearance, whether it's like, oh, I love her makeup, which is generally something that like, you know, that's positive. I like that or whatever. But the purpose of the evaluation is obviously to be about my course, to help me improve my you know, student learning outcomes for the next year. But I've also had them be kind of like a little sexualized or a little more vulgar. And obviously I don't know who these come from, um, but this discussion has come up in Trailblazers. It's come up in our faculty meetings where we know that women are more susceptible to these types of comments in our evaluations. And it's something that men don't typically deal with. So I would say that is definitely one. And then just everyday microaggressions that women experience. I mean, y'all all probably know what I'm talking about when I say I'll be going on a tangent saying something, but if a man says it louder and with more gusto, then he's got the room, right? Um, so those two things I happen to notice at least every semester, and I'm sure there are many more, but I know that those are some that we can all probably relate to, and it's just something that's definitely on my mind right now because Zoom has made me appreciate that mute feature, right? Like if I'm talking, I'm talking and I can't be easily interrupted, but I'm already feeling like the dread coming on for the end of the year evaluations because I'm like, all right, wonder what the comment's gonna be this year. So those are two I wanted to share. Yeah, for sure. Oh, Paris, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I guess I can <laughs> share. Um, so from the, I guess, um, from a corporate perspective, um, I worked at a company in the past that had a user conference every year and they would bring in the clients and, you know, um, they had me working on one of these, um, this one of their like payment products, which is something they were really pushing. So they had this very uh, closed door business meeting with this client, an older gentleman from North Carolina. And it's basically a bunch of men at the table and me. And the client walks in and looks at me and says, if she's here, I'm not sitting in this meeting. And I froze because what are you, like, I just froze. Like, that has never happened. It's a client. It's not like it's a coworker who can get fired. But, you know, what do you do in that moment, right? So um, the vice president of payment said, well, if she's not here, then we need to leave because she's the smartest person in the room. So we don't have a reason to have this meeting. So um, I've had experiences like that, other, you know, situations similar to that. And it, I have to question, like, when that happens, you know, would he have said that if I was a male or if I was, you know, um, you know, not a, a black woman or a woman, you know, of color. Um, so that type of situation just makes you question, like, wow, like, this type of thing happens in, in corporate America from the clients. Um, and so that's definitely an experience I've had. And it was shocking. So, yeah. Sweet. Well, thank you guys for sharing. Um, goodness, I couldn't even imagine that happening. That's very hard. And that's just frustrating too, to, like you said, I, whoever advocated for you and said, well, she's the smartest in the room, like yeah. definitely need people like that in our lives to kind of advocate for us. And, you know, just, I guess, be there and to speak out when things like that happen. Um, Okay, so the first like subject or topic, I guess we're going to discuss is negotiation, um, how to negotiate your salary, how to advocate for yourself when negotiating. Um, so I'm going to throw this question straight to Lori. Um, so Lori and every anybody can answer like after Lori does, but definitely wanted to, her um, knowledge on this first. So I guess like, how do you, how would you tell somebody to advocate when they're negotiating salary? 
Well, I think it depends on where you are in your career. And I will have to give major props to the salary negotiation seminars by the AAUW, um, which has given me a lot of tools, even though I teach the content. But as you're beginning your career, there are a lot of things to leverage as a young woman going into the workplace um, that may not directly relate to how much money is in your paycheck, but do equate to your health and wellness and stability further um, long-term because there are some things that are limited and you may not know the culture of the company, but I would say for young women starting out, um, early career professionals, always know your worth and don't be afraid of your worth. I actually uh, have a friend who finished the MBA program. One of her faculty members said, your work is no less than $350 an hour. So calculate it from there. And I go, oh, okay, well, if that's a starting point, then I am way too underpaid right now in my current position. But that's the type of thing that I think we need to hear to know that if this is what it costs to live my life, and we jokingly say, like, I have a champagne lifestyle and a beer budget, right, as college students. But I think it's, and really as faculty too and staff, um, but it is something to, there's something to be said about understanding like flexible time, maybe having certain days off or working remotely, which maybe nobody wants to work remotely if, you know, COVID disappears, but there are other things to be done um, around negotiating that part um, when it comes to Again, what's going to give you peace of mind? Because sometimes it's not about the money. Sometimes it's really about, and usually it's about the money, but sometimes if you can't get that bump, talk about bonuses, talk about merit pay, and really do a quick Google search on like payscale.com and see where the average or median income is for people who might be five and 10 years out. So you can look at how to have that conversation later on. And for, I think, mid-career, no matter what your industry is, there's always some report or some sort of mechanism and tool in which you can do a salary comparison or analysis and look at where you are. And granted, in upstate South Carolina, uh, the cost of living is a little bit lower than, say, San Francisco, right? But as a student applying for a job out there. Those are things that cost of living or having them pay for you to move. Things like that are always things to consider in those conversations because whatever, if it's your pocket that's being hit or if it's your quality of life that you're aiming for, quality of life usually is a little bit easier of a sell. And then once you're thriving and producing in that company or industry or whatever it may be, then I think the conversation around that bump in pay or the work that you're doing and how you're contributing, because you will have all of that to stand on as well, makes it easier. And of course, always ask for more than you know you think you're going to get. Always aim high, because the worst thing anybody can tell you ever is no. And if they tell you no, then the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So there's a conversation to be had. And again, understanding culture, understanding what you bring to the table, you can't not do anything, expect to make uh, lots of money. That was my dream, but uh, unfortunately I'm still laboring. Um, but I do think that as long as you know your worth and understand that it's a little bit more than just, again, the dollar amount, there are other things to be put on the table and thrown in the hat as it relates to your quality and experience. Yeah, I'll add on um, to that, Lori. I think um, you brought up a good point of just researching and talking about um, payscale.com and things of that nature. I'll share some of the things that um, I've done in the past, actually, that helped me as I transitioned here and some other institutions. So I've been a couple of places. And um, what I do is I have a, a Google Doc of job descriptions. So it's either do job descriptions of one that I want next, right? A dream job, the next point, or like you said, five to 10 years out. And so what I do is I just save those job descriptions. I highlight things like, okay, I, need, I know I need to learn a little bit more about budget, or I know I need to learn a little bit more about fundraising. But the main thing that I'm looking at is that, that salary. So that when I need to go and have a conversation with my supervisor or those who are empowered to give me a raise, or if I'm at my next job, I have an understanding of the industry. So I know, okay, Louisville, their assistant director position went for this much. Okay, Stanford, Stanford just hired someone for this much. All right, so this person, you go and do you do the cost of living calculation? You have all your data. So when you go, it's not just I feel like it's like, hey, I've I've seen what's what is going in our industry and I've done kind of the calculation so that added on with my education experience added on to um, me right I know my worth I I would feel more comfortable coming and and agreeing to 
this amount, right? Always aim high. The worst thing that they can say is no, but you know the amount that you really do need to get there and feel comfortable in your work. So do your research and do it proactively. I'm doing it right now. I'm not planning on going anywhere, but also it just helps me have a vision, have some goals, but have that data to back up behind why I'm worth this much and why you should keep me. Yeah, so um, I would just add on to that, that um, even if you, um, I do also recommend using, uh, doing the research, payscale.com, Glassdoor is kind of iffy, um, definitely get multiple sources because, you know, some of it is self-reported and even within the same company, you can have a huge range of what people in the same role are doing because there are many different departments, right? Um, and one thing that I've kind of a practice that I've picked up over the years is to update my resume quarterly. Um, and that so that even if I'm not looking for a job, it's so that I have an up-to-date um, tracking of what I worked on and what I brought to this company. Um, and then when I, it is time to look for another job, you have this long list of things that you contributed uh, to the company. And when you go to your resume builder or when you write your resume over, um, they may look at it and say, this is a, actually something that you think is not a big deal that they can actually hone in on and sell you to, you know, at a, at a not sell you, but, you know, promote you to another company. Uh, you know what I mean? your personality to another first uh, a company based on those skills that you you know may not have remembered if you just tried to write your resume at the last minute or like right when you start your job search so definitely um, updating the resume quarterly has helped because you have those things that um, can help you in negotiation can I add like one last thing um, this is different from what everybody else has said but I love all the advice I agree wholeheartedly but I think part of it too is that we as like a society have to start getting away from this mentality that everyone's salary who works with you is top secret. Um, if we're transparent about like what a male colleague of mine makes or anybody for that matter, that helps the rest of us who are being underpaid perhaps have arguments in our corner for like, you know, what is this about? Um, and at Clemson, maybe that's a little easier because I know we get like the annual salary reports or whatever, but like Lori spoke to, right? Like there are other perks to the job that maybe other people are getting that you might not be getting. So having these transparent conversations with each other helps everybody. Like what's the saying about like all ships rising or whatever? I can't think of it right now, but you catch my drift, you know my point, right? Like if we're all looking out for each other, then we're all going to end up being better because you know, everybody deserves to be paid for the work that they're worth, as everyone has commented on. Yeah, it isn't a secret what he makes when we did the same thing. Right, right, Jenna, exactly. Yes, those are all such good points. And I had like two or three other questions that y'all just like hit as you were talking. So um, just with like the resources and what can we do? So those are awesome points. Thank you guys for um, such a good perspective, especially as a 22 year old going into the work field, you know, in like a year and a half. It's really crazy. Um, but just like having the, like that knowledge in the back of my pocket is really nice too. Um, <laughs> yes, Jenna, <laughs> paying attention. <laughs> um, so moving on to like the career decision making um, and anybody can answer for the first one, but just um, as a woman, how did that affect your career decision, um, you know, your job search? What, um, how did that affect your decision that you made for your career? Well, I, I'll go, I mean, I was, I think my career is very unique. I was a student athlete. Um, very passionate about the student athlete experience. I not only was a female student athlete, but also a black female student athlete in a predominantly white sport, which is something that I'm really passionate about making sure that I am represent representation for not only our women, but our black women and other women that just can relate to myself. I think representation is huge. So that was a big reason for me to go into my career choice, but then also just to continue to um, grow and help other all um, student athletes and students grow. I think um, the biggest piece for me with representation is not only being there for women, but being there for men um, of all races and demographics so that they can see and they can learn how to interact with me. 
right? Or how to learn, interact with women, how to respect women, how to treat them with the same respect of um, if they come from a very male dominated household, right? So um, I, I had to work or I did work with a student before and I could tell he had never had to interact with someone, a woman or better yet a black woman from an authoritative um, standpoint, right? And so he just month by month by month, I made him acknowledge me when he walked in the office, right? Just little things. And by the end we were like this, but I joke around with him like before you were messing with me, but we just month by month by month, just being able to connect with him, but also show him like, hey, you can respect women, we, we can help you as well. Um, that's why I, I stay in this career and that's why I chose it so that I can help not only women, but other people respect women too in a different way. Okay, well, I'll just jump in. <laughs> so uh, I would say, okay, so being a woman, I would say not in like affected my career because my background is English and communication. And so I'm somehow in software and been working in software for like a, a decade, right? But what I will say is that, you know, they, you know, they say that they push women towards arts and, um, you know, liberal arts and they push men towards math and science. And that's starting to change. But um, I really see the value in women being in this field, right? Offering a different perspective versus just having a bunch of men at the table. Um, and so even though my past was English journalism, maybe being on CNN or something, um, ending up in software really wants, uh, makes me want to uh, push other women towards learning how to code, towards uh, learning how to you know, become a develop developer and things that they may not um, be um, pushed towards as they're coming up um, and, and even think of it as a career. Uh, so it was different for me, but it helps me to see how I want to help shape women and, and, and help them grow in, in the science and math fields. I can comment. Um, I really thought about this, like if this affected my career choice at all. And I don't think it did, but I also was the type of person who came out of college, Lori and I both did, where the economy was kind of like it is now. And it was just kind of go for what you can get. So I found myself in graduate school, like you are Gabby. And I was like, well, it, it's just been like that ever since, right? Like what's going to be the next step? What job is going to hire me? And then what do I want? But I will say this, and this is more trivial than what Sable and Paris have, but I still think it's important. Right out of graduate school, the first job I took, I moved to a city for a guy. And I will never in my life do that again, because I learned really quickly, right, that I was putting my dreams and my desires and this, that, and the third on the table, hoping that he would match it. And lo and behold, Clemson ended up hiring me, thank you, right after we split. And I just I chose me, right? I'm like, oh, like, this is a dream job. I'm going for it. Whatever else, you know, can fall, fall to the side, and I'm going to figure it out, because as much as we like to think our personal life and our professional life is separate, I mean, things like that sometimes prove that they're not always as separate as we want them to be. So I think that's good advice for anybody to keep in the back of their brain. If things are going to work out, they're going to work out. And in the meantime, you still need to get you a job. And the job that you get first can plan the trajectory for the rest of your 20s into your 30s, right? Like this is the sweet spot. This is the time. So I'm glad things worked out the way they did for me. And I always say that to people because I'm like, you just never know, like one decision you make can change the course of the next decade. I'll just echo that, not trivial. Same thing happened to me, which is how I ended up back in Clemson too, girl. So here we are, who knew? <laughs> and it didn't work out, same thing, same thing. Right, ditto. I'll just say ditto, same thing. <laughs> Moral of the story, don't follow boys, okay? <laughs> um, and kind of going into that, like, I think, Caitlin, you said, you know, Clemson was like the dream, you know, you're like, wow, this position is amazing. So um, I guess, how do you know, like, if a company or an institution is the right fit, how do you know if that's what's best for you when job searching? Um, for me, it was just two things. I guess, and still, I don't think I understand my worth. Like I still have imposter syndrome nine years in, but it was like, 
they really want to hire me like what um and I still feel like that now and I love the job and it, it doesn't always feel like work to me right like I love hanging out with students I love doing things like this but the other thing is other advice for other jobs I've had look at the people who work there right like say we'll just let us know representation matters look at the leaders who work there are they people who have priorities that match yours do the people look like you do they act like you do they respect who you are does it seem like they've ever seen somebody like you on staff or with them um, and that can be good or it can be bad right because if they have then hopefully that means they're more inclusive they're more open-minded but if they haven't it might mean that you're going to be the person who comes in and you're expected to do all these other things in the name of diversity or inclusion or whatever and that's not always so great right so I always like to tell students, like, if you go into a place and the people look like you and the people can understand who you are, then that's usually a good sign. But if it's not the case, then that might be a challenge for you. Some people are for the challenge. Some people aren't. And that's just kind of like a personal call you have to make. It's not one that's better than the other. It's just what it is. So. Does anybody else have anything to add to? <laughs> the question is about um, how do you know if a company is right for you, right? Yeah, I think that it's, it's gonna be different for each person. Um, for me personally, especially working in technology, um, as Lori mentioned earlier, having quality of life for me is like a big deal. Um, I like having the flexibility to work remotely, um, from wherever in the world and um, and having a diverse team, as Caitlin mentioned, or seeing people who, you know, I may be the only black male, but I see that there's diverse people there. That matters to me um, because then, because of the experiences that I've had sitting at a table, you know, and then got somebody walks in, as I explained earlier. So um, diversity, seeing that the company is either working on being diverse in a very genuine way, um, and uh, definitely having the flexibility and quality of life and those other things that come outside of having a salary, um, let me, you know, make me out, let me know if the, the company is the right fit for me. Awesome. Thank you, Ferris and Caitlin, for answering that. Um, Okay, so the next one, let's just say I get offered a job. Um, I get a job offer in a place where I feel like my sense of belonging as a woman or, you know, um, or like as a woman of color, um, if, that, if that's going to be challenged or threatened, what, what do you do in that sense? Um, if I feel like I'm going to be challenged or threatened um, as a woman, um, what do you do? Do you all have any advice on that? Gabby, I will take this because I've been in that situation. Um, so I am, to give you all a little background, I am from Orlando, Florida, and I will shout Florida unless it's embarrassing. Um, so I'm from Orlando um, and my first job out of grad school, I went to be an assistant coach at Marshall University. Great institution, the right fit for certain people, the right fit for certain student athletes. Um, I knew that it would be a challenge going from Orlando to Huntington, West Virginia. But when I got there, I was like, oh, oh, okay, got it. This is really going to be a challenge, right? Again, good fit for, for some other people, but as a young Black woman who just fresh out of grad school, it was really challenging. I mean, everywhere I went, um, my sense of belonging was challenged for sure. And I think it is finding, um, even, if, even if you don't have someone who directly relates or looks like you, I didn't have a Black woman there to just go kick it with and go get dinner or whatever. But finding your allies was really important for me. So going into it, if you're if you know it's going to be a challenge going into a place, you have to think about what your priorities are. My priorities was I need a job. <laughs> I'm out of grad school. I need a job. I wanted to be a coach at the time. Um, and and so going into it, I knew it was going to be challenging. But when I got there, I had to find allies. I had to find a small community. Um, I had to make sure that I was making an effort to find a church or some sort of small community to get me through if this was going to be a long term place. And um, just to, to let you all know, fast forward, it wasn't a long term place, partly because of the fit, um, but partly because I, I wanted to go back into administration. But I would say 
just be really fair with yourself and honest if you're going to be able to put in the effort to find those small communities and to find those allies in a space where there might not be a lot. For my students, I often recommend to think about it this way. No one hires you or accepts you to a position with the intention of you failing. And a part of that requires that transparent conversation about what your needs are. So if you've gotten to the point where you are offered this position or opportunity, then have that conversation in that acceptance negotiation, whatever it may be, have a conversation and look who's having it with you and be, I think this is the one time you can be upfront because it's very difficult for that person to go, well, you know what, your concerns are just kind of weird. So we're not going to do, but they will find someone, put the burden of effort on that for for that hiring partner. Um, and I think that typically shows up in the process of the job finding. Um, and I think Sable's absolutely right. Having Finding those communities does take work. I hear it all the time with people coming to Clemson and going like, where, what's happening here? Uh, and I go, I, I, I don't know. Uh, and it could be about anything, but there are people here and there's a group for everybody, whether you're an undergrad, grad student, um, whether you identify one way or another, there's something for everybody. It could be a small small um, in number or kind of invisible and undercurrent, but it's there. Uh, and I think that part of um, allyship, and there's a question in the chat too, um, but there, there's something to be said about how those conversations get had and who, and we sense it. I think we inherently kind of know when we are safer than in other places and we feel that, go with the gut. And I think that's when your gut instinct can really play into protecting you or know when you're being tokenized or being um, objectified in ways that make you feel uncomfortable. So that's when it's not a long-term, but use it as a springboard. So there are mechanisms in that. The question in the chat was, how can we as women in the workplace that aren't people of color be an ally where diversity is lacking? Watch TikTok videos and do nothing that is being made fun of. Like, don't do the, well, hey girl, like don't adopt phrasing unless you were just in there. Um, also don't ask to like touch hair or um, food thing. Like, don't be weird about it. Don't be strange and really TikTok, social media, all the memes, study them. Uh, Cause it's not just again, <laughs> black and white, right? It's, there's more to it. Or so if you have a friend who identifies as, who is queer identified, don't just be like, oh, wow. So uh, looking pretty butch today. I have heard people say this and it's not, it's not fun. It's not great. And it's awkward. And if you are that awkward turtle and I'm an awkward person, silence goes so far. And as long as you're silent with a smile, you can pick up on those things. However, as a person um, who is a woman of color, I can tell you that sometimes it turns into microaggressions and you might not even realize. And I feel truly, truly that some of the microaggressions that I've experienced from colleagues have not been from a place of malice, just misinformation or simply uninformed. Do I do the work and say, okay, well, I'm going to tell them about themselves. And it hopefully like this, in this radical candor moment, maybe sometimes I'm there, sometimes I'm not. And I think that's another part of the puzzle. You have to expect that, especially if you're working in a place like Clemson and you know what Clemson looks like on the surface, um, understanding that sometimes people are doing the labor double or multiple times because they're coming out of a classroom situation where they're the only person of color in front of a class of 50 students who then question them because of their their race or their gender or what they look like just in general um, to going to a workplace where they're not seen or heard because of what assumptions people have made about them. So I would just quickly add that it's Definitely, definitely don't touch hair because someone actually did touch mine. I mean, I can stop into a lot now that I say it out loud on this panel. But anyway, <laughs> I did have someone early on in my career, right after grad school, like touch my hair and say, it's so pretty. And I like, what in the world? Okay, anyway, but definitely don't do that. But I think definitely showing up in a genuine way, right? Like, um, and what does that mean? So to me, um, recently, as you, as we all know, right, there were protesting in the streets of Atlanta, and I had two different experiences with my my white coworkers. I had one who, in the meeting, like right after, I'm feeling very 
you know, things are going on in the country that's affecting my people, right? So I'm feeling very heavy. And she's like, hey, so what did you do this weekend? Did you, you know, like go play in a pool or something? I was just like, what? But I, and it just felt so, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Like clueless, but not really that. Like it, it felt, it felt like she knew what was happening, but also just wanted to avoid it, right? And then I had other coworkers, white coworkers, who reached out to me individually and said, are you okay? I, I want to be here for you. I don't know how. That was very genuine. They don't know how. They don't know what to say, but they're here if I need anything, you know? And I may not reach back out. I mean, I did, but I think that is the difference between being genuine with your um your coworkers who you want to connect with, who, you know, don't look like you, but you want to show them that you're there for them versus just kind of avoiding the situation because it's uncomfortable, right? Because we're already uncomfortable, like having to be in the situation of going to work every day and acting like everything's okay. Or, you know, so I don't know. I hope that helps a little bit, but that's what I would say from my perspective. All good things, all good things. I'm like, wow, yes. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna move on to fairness and promotions and then we'll answer some questions in the chat as well. Um, so the first question I have for y'all is, how do you ensure that you're in an environment that's fair and that has opportunities to grow as a woman? I'll just quickly say, I, hold a position where I'm in a lot of decision-making positions. And I think I work with uh, leadership that actually is attuned to the necessity of having different voices at the table and working within the parameters outline, but also pushing when we know to push. So there are things that it's never silenced, um, but it's always noted. And if it comes up again and again, every, then it's pushed even further. So I think there is, there's something to be said about um, being an advocate and recognizing how your advocacy is playing out in action. And sometimes it has like that tempered radical idea. It's not me, you know, bull in a china shop saying, this is what needs to happen. I see this in my colleagues and it's terrible. It's, we all see this, right? Okay, so we're gonna note this because I'm gonna be a paper cut until something happens and whatever I can do to help that along, um, I'm gonna do it. And then there is also, I think the flip side of that Sometimes it's culture and you have to understand like, well, where can I start breaking stuff and get, get noticed? And that environment has to change. Where can it critique? And it may not be on the Zoom town hall that happened in the chat function. That is not how this works in higher ed. It could be in the small local department or unit that you have some litmus of control in. So I think environment is a tricky one because yes, culture shift is gonna happen. But I, I think I read somewhere that higher education and healthcare are the two most rigid industries that are most resistant to change because of the policies and the, the methods in which they operate and other spheres this is why we have like cool tech spaces getting highlighted and whatnot because of how amenable they are to being exceptional workplaces. So I think it's just paying attention to where you are and using that voice. And if you are uncertain of that voice, use it anyway. Because again, the worst thing anybody can tell you is no. Awesome. So the next thing is just on the basis of promotion, how would I advocate for myself? Um, when it comes to promotions. Do you all have any advice on that? I can say a little bit, but it's different for us here at Clemson because as a lecturer, the promotion, the ranks are already set forward for you, right? Like I'm senior lecturer. When it comes time, I can go up for principal lecturer and that's the same across the board. And it's the university's way, I presume, of rewarding people, but also keeping it fair so that you don't have to worry, you know, about like, oh, well, is he getting this? Is she getting that? Um, but something I tell my students when they write cover letters and also just in regular life advice, like no one is going to be your cheerleader. Like you have to be willing to advocate for yourself. So many young people, especially women, 
are afraid of saying things like, well, I did this and that and this, and yes, I did it all well. And yes, I did it all at one time. And yes, I can get it together and do all the things that you ask of me because we're used to like making ourselves smaller or quieter or being more demure. But no, put it out there, be loud about it. Be like, well, I did all of this compared to these other people. Like there are numerical ways that you can take your accomplishments and compare those with people across the board to ensure that you are objectively doing more than other people are. And those things work in your favor when you're going for a promotion. But like Lori keeps saying, I mean, all they can say is no. And then, you know, then you have a whole new set of questions and decisions to make. But if you don't pull for yourself, if you don't put it all out there very blatantly for your boss or whoever to see, then who else is, right? Like you have to be willing to do it for yourself and keep record of those things so that hopefully they'll see your worth and pay you for it. Awesome. Yes, totally agree. We're going to move on to um, empowerment just for the sake of time. Um, the first question I have for y'all is how can I find the empowerment to address male privilege in the workplace, especially when it's directly impacting me? I, so I've had to do this um, and it was not easy at all because of imposter syndrome, because of the fear of if I'm, if I come off too strong or dominant, then they're completely going to shut down or shut off. And I think what a couple of points to remember is one, make sure in all of this, still continue to, to develop relationships with everyone in the workplace, whether it's a man, woman, transgender, whomever, develop the relationship. So when you have to have these crucial conversations, it's not necessarily super personal, but you all want the same thing. You want an inclusive, you should want an inclusive workplace. Um, you, you, you want to make sure that you're serving whoever you're serving, right? And in order to do that, everyone's gotta be on the same page. Um, so just remember in those crucial conversations when you're sitting down with the male colleague, I had to sit down with him and say, hey, look, um, when I say something and you unmute yourself and you say the same exact thing, I just need you to think about how that would feel. If I did that and I unmuted myself and repeated exactly the same, I don't understand why you feel the need to do that. Like, was my voice not loud enough? Do I need to speak louder? I don't understand what's going on, right? But he had no idea. He had no clue, had zero awareness, and he felt terrible. Um, but I had to lay it out for him. So I would say, make sure that you have a relationship with the person. Remember the shared pool of meaning, right? In crucial conversations, but then also come with examples, right? And and not necessarily in a petty way, but make sure you're honest. And I think um, that that comes with the fear of of being. I, I smile a lot. Lori knows me. I'm I'm hype. I I'm a smiler. I'm a I, I definitely am energy. But in the workplace, I'm very direct. So I have to be very mindful of how I approach certain conversations, and I have to make sure I'm developing those relationships because it can come off a certain way. So I had to do this, and since then, this person has been very aware, and it's kind of funny because he did it one time and he immediately apologized. Like I'm so sorry. I was like, oh, it's cool. You're learning. We're good. We're learning here. It's great. But he knows I'm coming from a genuine place. And also I believe that he genuinely was sorry. He just didn't know. So sometimes it's just educating people, coming with your receipts and then, you know, keep going. I was just saying I agree with all of that because I, I work in a, a male dominated field and um, and my role requires me to um, influence and to lead. And I'm typically leading a team of men, right? And they come from different cultures that aren't always receptive to women being in charge. And so building relationships, um, you know, not necessarily pretending we're going to be best friends, but, you know, building that type of relationship where you can go to them one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, you know, this is what happened. You know, let's talk about that, you know. And I definitely have had to, um, you know, pull men aside in the same way that they will explain and just say this this is what's going on in these meetings and definitely having your facts. There's an app that I don't remember the name of, so I'm sorry, um, that I learned about that actually, if you run it in a meeting, it'll tell you how many times a man has cut you off in the meeting, right? And that happens, yeah, I know, it's cool. It's probably just how many times a person cuts you off, but it's like a feminist app, so there you go. Um, but anyway, 
So, which is good. So, um, but, you know, that type of, you know, not saying use that as a fact, but having those examples of, hey, I was in this meeting, as exactly as Sable said, you know, this is, I was saying this, the exact same thing, and you just took credit for the exact same thing that I said, or you cut me off this many times when I was trying to get my thought out. So those are, you know, things that I would, I definitely agree with. That's exactly how it should be done. Can I add one quick thing? Sorry. Um, I love this advice, right? Like in my head, I can picture that meme of um, the vice presidential debate where she was like, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. Um, but that, you know, that's hard to do for a lot of us, at least if you're, you know, not well into your career and don't have like the authority. But I will say this, there are going to be some people, some men who just don't get it. Like you can tell them a hundred thousand times that they've mansplained you, that they're interrupting you and this and that. And sometimes your empowerment is your own inner peace and you learning the ability to just be like, whatever. Okay. Like, and you move on because I used to not be that person and I would stew on it forever. And I would go home really angry about what this person had said or how they had interrupted me. And I had tried to explain it to them and they're just not getting it. But at the end of the day, they're not the one stressing over it. I am. And that's not empowering me if I can't focus on what I need to do about my job or in my personal life because of some crap somebody said in a meeting. So if none of those strategies work, sometimes you're just going to have to be like, talk to the hand or whatever, because it is what it is. Yes. Yes, just yes to everything, retweet to everything, preach to everything. <laughs> um, the last question before, because I want to be able to answer um, audience questions too. So how is we, how can we as women empower other women in our workplaces? Like what are practical things we can do to lift each other up? One of my closest friends at work um, is a colleague, and we never really see each other at work, but we became friends because I was there probably at nine o'clock at night trying to get the schedule together or registration. There was something, and she was in the office copying things or whatnot, and the first thing she ever asked me was, hey, are you okay? And it was the first time somebody had checked on me emotionally, because it, it wasn't a, you okay? It was, hey, are you okay? And I was like, no. <laughs> Just nine o'clock at night, I'm a grad student just trying to figure it out. And that was one of the things where I think we don't do, I, th I think with certain people, it's okay. And we have a cool relationship, but I think I myself can be better at checking in on people and opening the door for the conversation to be had about building each other up. And I mean, I love it. Uh, Caitlin and I are on this group message that I absolutely, when it pops up, I'm like, oh, this is going to be a good time. But I love those moments when we can share together in things and actually have a relationship outside of work. So in the workplace, and it, not everybody's meant to be friends. I also love it when Jenna shows up for the once a year kind of intern check-in because that is so fun. So shout out to Jenna because it's a good it's good to see people outside of the general general uh, scheme of things because the energy is just so good. So I feel like just checking in and like a how are you is a good way to start. Um, but I'll let the other ladies contribute on how we build that even further. Okay, I was gonna let somebody else jump in first, but I'll go, okay. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, same thing. There's definitely, um, as there's been, there are more women coming onto our um, our team. And that's one of the things that I've, you know, I've been trying to figure out, like, how do we build this, you know, um, connection as women in the workplace versus just, um, you know, not having that connection, right? Because something's going to happen and we'll have to find a way to stick together. And I think it's just, you know, reaching out, talking to them, checking in, you know, learning about their background. And, um, and like I, I'll, I've been saying, just being just genuine and wanting to learn who they are. And, um, and then that eventually builds that connection that when you do need to um, vent or something, you have someone there, you have an ally. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, I think one thing that I try to do, especially in uh, athletics, there's a couple of associations specifically that serve women in athletics or serve women in higher education. So whenever I see um, a graduate assistant or we have an intern, 
I'm making sure that they know everything about it. Even, I mean, I'm not going to force them to join, but at least they know the mission. Um, if I'm on a call and it's a, a circle call or some, I'm inviting them into my office to sit here and listen. Um, and then also following up on certain um, conversations that we have. And I think Paris, I agree, just genuine, but also being vulnerable. Like, hey, imposter syndrome, whoop, right here right here you are not alone so following up on that and just being vulnerable even if it's i'm a leader or in a more position of authority i'm still a human being so i i've seen that really be able to breed some connection with other women and um, continuing to follow up with them I, i've seen as being helpful awesome well that was the end of the prepared questions I had. And I know we're like three minutes to our end time. So I do want to get some audience questions or other people questions in too. Um, so if you need to go, I completely understand. I will send a follow-up email with a good with a good tip sheet and contact information. Um, but if you can stay, that'd be great. Um, so one of the questions in the chat was, have you had women mentors? How have they shown up for you? And similarly, have you had male mentors and how have they showed up for you? I remember the first time uh, as an undergraduate uh, and there was a program I was in and the director or assistant director was a man. And I remember we had these check-ins, not advising meetings, but just we had to go into the office and we had to do it. Otherwise, I guess we would lose our scholarship or something. So very important. Um, and I remember walking in and then just bursting into tears. And I'm not a person that just cries like that, uh, but the he didn't say anything. He closed the door. He handed me the Kleenex and he, he just kind of sat there. And I just remember, oh, we're going to be real friends. And, but the next question, the series of questions he asked me, he goes, what, what's happening? And as a part of the program, I was the first woman of color to ever be in the program. And there were things and resources that he was not aware of, but he listened and it went on for two hours. And I, I was like, I'm not this emotional. I am embarrassed. I, um, I, I'm not certain of what to do next. Um, and he he listened and that was one of the best things. And he's still a mentor for me today and he works with the Coca-Cola Scholars Program. And so we're always in conversation about what, you know, is happening in the lay of the land of the um, higher education and where students are going and what he's seeing. And um, I think for me, male mentors have shown up in surprising ways that I was not expecting. And uh, because there are men all around, but I am very, I'm aware of my identities and how I may be showing up in different spaces as well. Uh, but I would say men, um, the men in my life who are mentors to me have always been an advocate and have been active listeners. I've been the one speaking and they're the ones listening. And it's always that sense of them wanting to learn so they can be a better advocate uh, for others. And so I see that playing out with one of my uh, mentors and really role models, great as a human being and for women as well. And, uh, and there are people who have come in and out of my life as mentors, uh, because that's just, you know, the season of things. And I think you, as mentorship plays out, you do have to be attuned to that. Not everybody's going to be in your life forever, but there could be a reason that you're in that space with them. But I will say some of the more emotionally vulnerable moments I've had, those are the mentors that are the longer lasting ones, mostly because I just don't want them to tell anybody else that I actually cry. But for the second half of that, it's really, I was able to be vulnerable and I think it's just a good sense of who they are and they see me for me. They see the imposter syndrome, they see the doubt, but they also see my capability and the character. And that tends to be the marker of, okay, this person's in my life and we're holding on tight, like Velcro. Anyone have anything else to add on that one? No, okay. Okay, perfect. The next one was, have you heard the comment that you intimidate men and what did you do about it? I've been wanting to say this since I saw this on the little thingy. I hate when people say this to me, okay? I hate when people say this at work. I hate when people say this in my dating life because I'm like, what are you afraid of? I'm not a cannibal. I'm not an alligator. Like, what do you think is gonna happen? But what men mean when they say that is, this interaction that I'm having with you, female, is about to reveal some weakness that I'm not ready to confront. And we have to get past that. 
it's like this aspect of toxic masculinity that lets them off the hook by not confronting weaknesses that let's be honest, we have to confront continuously all day, every day, just to be in the spaces that we're in. Um, so I've been like constantly thinking of like a response that's not flippant, like I'm not an alligator that I could say to people when they say that, because I'm like, some of the biggest growth moments I've had as a human being came from moments where I was like, holy crap, like I'm scared to confront some reality that I'm about to learn. And if we keep letting men off the hook with that, then it's, they're never going to evolve. Like it's never going to get any better for them or for us. Like as soon as they recognize that getting through this moment of weakness is about to be better for both parties involved, then good for all. But that's obviously just my opinion. Caitlin, my husband, when we first met, told me I was intimidating. And the other day, um, I like said something about it. And he was like, no, you're just powerful and strong. And I was like, yes. I was like, thank you for like full circle moment. I was like, yes. <laughs> um, okay, in the chat, gender bias in the workplace can lead to conflict among women. How would you navigate a situation where another woman was the driving source of a toxic work environment? Lori mentioned building people up rather than tearing them down, but it becomes challenging when someone is facing some of the same challenges as you is also contributing to your struggles. It's a good question. Also, how does the workplace culture contribute to or allow this unfortunate situation and how can leadership or yeah, how can leadership as well as everyone else in the work environment combat this? That's a great question. Yes. Lauren, who do we need to go get? <laughs> yeah, let's pull up. <laughs> Um, I'll start this because I think Paris, and I know Sable, you unmute it, but in graduate school in Paris, and I full disclosure, we went to grad school together. That's how we know each other. But there was a person, we were all in grad, yes, generated to write, I love it, um, who I personally felt victimized by every day. And I thought we were cool. I looked, she was older. And so I looked up to her and then come to realize there are actually things working behind the scenes in this situation. Um, so I'm Paris, I'm talking about gaps and I'm talking about a certain individual in that program. So I, and I was hurt, I was decimated because I'm like, how could somebody be working behind the scenes against me? Not wanting to me to go, not wanting me to go for this leadership position, not wanting me to succeed, but yet in my face, invite me to things, want me to show up, want me to engage in ways that are otherwise I thought maybe we're not friends, but I look up to you and I literally am this lost puppy without your guidance in the, in the beginning. And so Lauren, I would say it, get, it depends on personality. I am not confrontational at all, but I do believe that if there is something going on and it's a shared situation and there is toxic, toxicity, there we go. I am one to say something to the person and it could be very, you know, nicely. I think compassion um, is still should be built in, but there's a point where you're going to break. And my mental health and wellness does not need to come into contact with whatever else is going on with another person. And I learned that hard lesson because we were in a class together and I go, she wanted to work on a project with me. And I go, I don't think that's going to be a great idea. And that led to a further conversation around what had been happening outside of the classroom, but definitely going to impact my space. So I think that it's what kind of what Caitlin mentioned, there are things that you're going to have to say goodbye to and that whole allyship of woman to woman, just because we share identities doesn't mean we're going to be friends. And I think that's a real aspect to it. Now, I do believe in the, we don't have to let everybody else know that we're enemies because there's something about keeping your business, your business, um, but share with other people, you know, I'm going to text Paris if I have something happen at work here because, you know, there's safe spaces. But I do think there is a certain moment where confrontation is critical um, or crucial conversations are critical because those things need to happen um, for your own wellness. And it's not to gossip to the group chat, but really to have that person know where you stand and what you see. And I can share, um, I'm actually going to just drop it in the chat, feedback. Like when you do this, I feel this way. I believe it's happening because, and what I would like to see is a dialogue around this. So giving that feedback in a way where it's using I statements, if they're not receptive to it, move on. If they are, keep it going. But I am just 
going to be completely honest, sometimes you need to like step to a person and you, Jenna's ready to go. I'm ready to go. If we all need to sit down and kumbaya together, we can do that. Okay. So use, you, use your mentors, use your allies too in those spaces. Cause it can be very helpful to bounce ideas off of them. Awesome. Are there any more questions? You feel free to unmute, put it in the chat. Um, anything else that anybody wants to ask? If not, we um, are good to go then. I will be emailing um, kind of a tip sheet to you guys as well as um, our contact information. Um, and I recorded this, so I can also send you that if you want that. Um, I think it'll be posted as well. But um, thank you guys for all being here. Thank you to our lovely panelists. Such good wisdom and good insight into just like the struggles of being a woman in the workplace and how we can conquer that and overcome. So I really appreciate you guys. Thank you for um, everybody who came. I really appreciate it. And um, we will follow up and we will also stay here if you have a question you didn't want to ask um, or something like that. We'll, we'll stay behind. But thank you guys so much.